Hello and welcome back. This is the week two lecture. So I would like to cover chapter two. Uh, that is the reading for this week. Hopefully we all have the book by now. You know, if you're having any issues, let me know. But I would like to talk about some of these traditional approaches to literature. So you remember back in week one, we covered some really basic foundational uh, literary elements. We also called them sort of pre-critical approaches or pre-critical elements. These are things that we're already familiar with, terms and concepts that we've learned before. You know, we talked about plot, character, setting, theme, all of that good stuff. And, you know, we talked about the fact that, you know, those are sort of the essential building blocks that we need uh, in order to conduct literary analysis. But we call them pre-critical because they've existed as long as literature and they sort of existed before we had an organized, coherent discipline of literary criticism. So this week, we're moving into some approaches that we would call critical. Uh, they weren't always formal. They weren't always codified. And we, we do view them as old in some cases, uh, old fashioned, traditional, uh, certainly. But what we're going to see and what you'll see as you work your way through chapter two is that a lot of these uh, approaches are still with us in various ways. A lot of newer critical approaches that we're going to be learning in the weeks to come, they borrow heavily from a lot of these traditional approaches that we'll be talking about today. So a lot of these really haven't gone anywhere, but they've been refashioned or refitted, sort of adapted to slightly more modern usages. <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move along. But like I was saying in week one, you know, the study of literature in higher education is not that old of a thing. Uh, it's a relatively recent development in the Western world. Uh, for a very long time, the only literature really taught in colleges and universities would have been classical literature, meaning the texts of ancient Greece and ancient Rome primarily. And those would have been considered worthy of study, <laughs> uh, but not stuff created, you know, uh, in more contemporary eras, not really until the 19th century did we see the study of literature written in English really uh, studied at the college or university level. So in the 1800s, uh, we do sort of expand uh, our conceptions of what types of literature can be taught uh, in higher ed, but the reasons we taught literature were different back then. So the book points this out. Back in the 19th century, literature, you know, from England uh, or maybe other, you know, parts of Europe, but if we're just thinking about the English language tradition, we're at this point mostly talking about literature produced uh, in the British Isles. So of course, America's around, but we're still early. We're in our literary infancy and we're not really read uh as widely as English authors uh, for much of the 19th century. Of course, that's changed now. But uh, if we're going back in time to this sort of dawn of a more expanded sense of literary study, you know, they're expanding it. But the reason they're looking at these works of literature, they're not really regarding them necessarily as works of art or even uh works of entertainment, they're really viewed uh, based on their ability to provide moral instruction or to provide information about history or maybe biography. So as the book says, literature was more of like a, a vehicle. It was seen as a way to sort of get us to more important areas of study and human life. It was a vehicle, it was a means to an end, and it was sort of subordinated or considered secondary to these other, you know, sort of older disciplines like history, like linguistics, like biography. Uh, and literature was just a way to get at those other things. Now, of course, that changed. Uh, over the next 100 years or so, literature increasingly becomes studied uh, more and more as you know, uh, 
artistically valuable, you know, uh, objects. And as this happens, as literature becomes more and more appreciated uh, for its sort of intrinsic value as art, uh, we have the development of new approaches many of which we're going to be covering this semester, new critical approaches that largely displace these older traditional approaches that in many ways had been the primary uh, means by which criticism was conducted for centuries. But with the dawn of formalism, or the new critics. This is especially true, of course, in the U.S., and this happens around the middle of the 20th century. So we're going to talk about the formalism uh, sort of development and phenomenon. We're going to talk about uh, the formalists next week in week three. But now what you need to know, we're not going to get into what the, all of the things they do and think, but what's important is their development, you know, in the middle of the 20th century represents this, this clear sort of break between these older ways of conducting literary scholarship or criticism and a new way. And as the book points out, the new way, the new criticism or, or formalism was all about the text itself. They wanted to focus exclusively on the text in front of them. They didn't want to think about history or biography or linguistics. They weren't concerned with all of those larger contexts that a lot of these traditional approaches in chapter two are largely interested in. So that was a big part of the break. The formalists wanted to focus on literature as art. They wanted to focus on the inherent value of individual texts, and they didn't think the importance of the texts were dependent on what the text could tell us about history or the author's life or whatever. So that was a big break and a big sort of moment in the development of literary study. So on one side of this divide that was beginning to form in the middle of the 20th century, you had these traditional scholars and critics who still subscribed to the five, to one or more of the five approaches that we're going to be talking about today. And then on the other side of the divide, you had the new critics, the formalists who didn't care about all of that old stuff. They just wanted to analyze the structure and the form of the text itself and derive as much meaning as they could from what they saw on the page. Now, okay, so that was big. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we do discuss formalism next week. But what's funny, and the book points this out, and we know this in other walks of life, you know, what's old becomes new again. You know, old trends always come back. It doesn't matter what we're talking about, whether it be music or fashion, or in this case, literary criticism and theory. Because formalism became passe after a while, and a lot of the newer approaches that came along after formalism sort of returned to focusing on those larger contexts, history, culture, other things that might have shaped the text, things that went beyond just the form, the structure, the individual words and sentences. So, and we're going to talk about those later approaches, of course, later, but things like, <clears throat> excuse me, things like <clears throat> new historicism, you know, uh, post-colonialism, they're obviously very interested in these larger contexts, uh, cultural studies, all of these newer approaches that came along after formalism, they really did owe a lot to some of these traditional approaches, but they're reshaping a lot of those traditional concepts and changing them in interesting ways, as we will see over <laughs> a long period of time. So again, we're getting into formalism more next week, so I'll save that. But just be aware of that divide that sort of, you know, was, was created in the middle of the 20th century as the traditional uh, uh, approaches that we're covering today were at least temporarily sort of displaced by this newfound sort of text-based approach. Formalism was really text-centered. It was all about the text. And for a while, that reigned supreme. But then that got old and new stuff had to come along to replace it. And a lot of that new stuff looked a little bit like the old stuff. So again, this week is devoted to understanding some of these older sort of foundational approaches 
to literature and we are going to cover five I'm using a slightly different numbering system than the textbook I find their headings and numbers to be a little confusing at times but I've taken all of their stuff I'm gonna present it as five sort of distinct approaches and we'll talk about each one. I'll give you a few additional examples, but hopefully you're noticing that in each chapter, uh, our textbook is going to use that same handful of texts, Frankenstein, <laughs> uh, you know, Huck Finn, uh, etc. And they're going to basically uh, use them as examples to see how these different approaches look in action. So you see them sort of doing that in chapter two, they'll do it in uh, the ensuing chapters as well for all of these different uh, critical approaches. So let's start with the first one, uh, what they call sort of textual scholarship or textual criticism. So let's be clear here. I just labeled formalism as a text-centered or text-based approach because it's all about the text, not about the larger context. Uh, that's true. But down here, when we talk about a textual scholarship, we don't mean uh, what we're talking about here is not the same as what we're talking about with formalism. Here, they're concerned about the text, very much so, uh, to the exclusion of most other things. But their mission isn't the same as the formalists. They're not really trying to extract meaning from the formal elements that they see on the page, the structures. Uh, they are trying to create a definitive, authentic version of a particular text. So this is an approach that many of us will probably never really experience firsthand. I'm going to, as we move through these, I'm going to try to use myself a little bit since my background is in literature. Uh, I'll try to kind of, when possible, I'll try to give you guys some examples of some of my own experience with some of these traditional approaches, but I can't really do that with the textual scholarship approach because I've never done this kind of work. Most modern humans have it, but it's important work. So they, <laughs> I don't mean to dismiss it, but it's just that uh, this is, you know, almost a separate discipline in many ways from modern uh, sort of you know, contemporary literary study. So as they say, a lot of times this approach is associated with older texts. And you can see the need for scholars to work on creating definitive versions of certain texts. Because if you're thinking about authors like Chaucer or Shakespeare, who they mention, it can be hard to really sift through all the different manuscripts, all the different versions and editions that have come out uh, over you know centuries featuring works from these authors. So uh, what these types of scholars do is they kind of go back through uh, the history of these different versions and editions. Uh, they learn what's kind of become altered or corrupted over the years and but the book does point out we can do this with contemporary text as well but we typically see this work done most often with older text so there's a lot of work to be done within this area obviously they're doing on some level they're kind of doing some editorial work they are looking for omissions they are looking for errors typographical errors you know errors in spelling uh, or mechanics but they're also studying the genesis and the development of a text. So kind of how it comes to be, how it gets created, because this is you know, often an interesting, somewhat messy process. So they use the example of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, a very famous poem, and they talk about the influence of his editor and friend and sort of contemporary, Ezra Pound, and uh, this type of scholarship really reveals the role that Pound played in the creation of that poem. Because we see, if we go back to some of the earlier drafts that Eliot may have submitted, we see that the poem was kind of clunky and it, was, it wasn't really coming together. And Pound helped shape it with his editorial work. And scholars have discovered that by doing this type of... Uh, this type of work. They've gone back, they've looked at those earlier manuscripts, those earlier drafts. They do this work with books like 
Great Expectations because Dickens wrote different endings. Like he wrote an alternate ending and then he disowned some other ending. Or with another example they use is Thomas Hardy's Return of the Native, which went through multiple versions. And it's kind of up to these types of scholars to collate, uh, sort of sift through, make decisions about which versions are the closest to the artist's vision. And that's that's hard work. <laughs> it can get messy, like I said. So they're kind of navigating the editorial processes that the authors and editors went through. They're looking at the revision process. And they are looking at what we call accidentals. You know, again, the spelling errors, inconsistencies in capitalization, or <laughs> the usage of italics, paragraph construction. But then they mention these sort of bigger picture Concerns these more sort of the the substantives, right? The actual ways that all of this stuff can affect readings, the ways that these things can influence reception and uh, understanding. So there is sort of a bigger picture thing here. It's not just about oh, let's find the version with the fewer with the fewest number of errors, <laughs> uh, because again, we need this work to be done. The way I look at this approach is it's very necessary, but it's often, uh, this approach is all about providing the materials necessary for future literary analysis. So all of this work gets us started on our work, because we need definitive versions of the text that we are studying. We need reliable versions that aren't full of errors, uh, that represent the closest we can get to what the author intended, or in some cases, what the editor intended, uh, if we think that maybe the editor uh, was helping to improve the text. So uh, literary scholars need this work to be done, but it's often, it's kind of, a lot of it's been done by earlier generations uh, of scholars, but of course, you know, uh, with more contemporary texts, uh, this stuff might still, you know, there might still be a lot of opportunities for a younger batch <laughs> of critics and scholars to engage in this. But uh, just to think of a, a little bit of, a, of an alternative media example, I always think about uh, movies. And if you guys are, are movie fans, you've probably come across some director's cuts over the years, they mention that as an example in the book. But I specifically think about a movie like Blade Runner, which has had at least three different versions come out since it first debuted back in 1982. So you have that original theatrical version uh, from 82. But the studio forced some changes that the director, Ridley Scott, didn't want. So then 10 years later, in 1992, they came out with what was called the director's cut. But apparently they didn't get Scott's full cooperation. And he wasn't happy with that version either. He said that version was also uh, not really what he had in mind. So it wasn't until 2007 that we got what was called the final cut, I hope so, and that's supposed to be the definitive, authentic version of what Ridley Scott's vision originally was, right? It's the closest uh, to what he originally intended, um, and there's been no larger interference. He had complete control over that version, unlike the two earlier versions. So that could then spark an interesting debate. We could watch all three versions and decide, well, was his uh, complete control version truly better than that 82 version? Because again, sometimes we might side with the studio or the editor and say, no, the author had a good you know, had some good ideas, but this later version shaped by the editor, dictated by uh, some outside force might, to some, be superior. So, you know, it, uh, you can end up with a lot of different interpretations uh, based on this kind of work. But just to give you a movie example, uh, we do see this in other, uh, in other fields of art. You know, so like they say in the book, this is not a, an exact science, but it's a little bit closer to science than a lot of the other approaches that we more typically use. So, again, this doesn't really get us uh, 
directly at analysis and original interpretation. This is more about accuracy and reliability, providing the versions of texts that advanced students and scholars can use. That's the real utility here. So it's not an exact science, but they do have a rigorous methodology kind of all their own. <laughs> uh, and we don't necessarily do a lot of this work, but we rely on it. So I'm always looking for, uh, you know, critical editions of texts, definitive versions. Uh, sometimes that can be hard, but a lot of this work with older texts, which is what I teach, I teach 19th century. Uh, so for me, a lot of this work has luckily already been done. But again, for more contemporary texts, there might be more opportunities to sort of seek out those definitive versions, especially if there's discord between author and editor or author and publishing company or director and studio, director and editor, <laughs> director and writer. Uh, there can always be interesting differences in versions, editions, and visions. So let's move on to number two, this is, a, this is a, an approach that we should already be pretty familiar with because we all know genre. So all we're talking about here is genre study or a genre-based criticism. So this is a criticism simply based on different types or kinds of literature, different categories that we use to classify different texts. So, as the book points out, a lot of our modern conceptions about genre have been passed down from ancient Greece and Aristotle's uh, sort of early work of criticism, uh, poetics. So, a lot of this stuff hasn't really changed all that much, especially if we're thinking about some of our major categories of literature. Uh, <laughs> so, our understanding of some of these large categories or genres like drama, uh, epic poetry, lyric poetry, you know, our conceptions haven't changed that much. You know, those genres have been pretty well defined for, you know, millennia, really. I mean, they've <laughs> for a long, long time. Now, we do have newer genres of literature. So, you know, novels are relatively new in the grand scheme of things. The modern novel, as we know it in the English language, has really only been around since maybe the early 18th century. So compared to poetry, uh, novels are kind of the new kids on the block. Short stories are even newer. So when I teach kind of an intro to lit, uh, I talk about the four principal sort of categories of literature. And these, this is kind of traditional. Uh, we can probably open this up a little bit more. But we talk about drama. We talk about poetry. We talk about short stories and novels. So those typically are the four major genres in sort of the Western world, in the English-speaking world, uh, most of the time. But within those large genres, we can get more specific. And we can sort of identify, you know, more narrow categories. So within poetry, for example, we can distinguish between epic poetry, you know, generally telling a narrative generally quite long versus lyric poetry. Uh, those are different genres of poetry. If we're looking at novels, we know there are multiple genres that we can explore. Uh, you know, realistic novels, we can look at magical realism, we can look at sentimental novels, we can look at gothic romances. There are a lot of different types, and that's true for really all of those major categories of Literature. There's different types of drama, different types of short stories, although I would argue there are fewer subcategories of short stories, but uh, plenty of subgenres if we're talking about novels, uh, drama, or poetry. And we're generally familiar with genres. I think watching TV shows and movies and sort of consuming other types of art helps us because a lot of these genres cross over into different mediums, different kinds of texts. But again, just kind of going back to Aristotle for a moment, like he really has given us a lot of foundational concepts, particularly when it comes to drama, really in general, tragedies in particular. But we still think about a lot of the sort of key characteristics that he set down in relation to drama, plot, character, theme, he called it thought, uh, diction, spectacle, the melody part. I mean, we don't always have 
uh, you know, chanting or singing. But, you know, a lot of those fundamental ingredients, obviously, we still have them. Uh, and we still discuss them when we perform literary analysis. He also gives us the notion of mimesis, which is a word you should write down when you come across it in the chapter when they're talking about genre. Uh, this is just the basic idea that works of literature are imitations of real action. <laughs> which is very obvious and kind of foundational to us, but Aristotle is writing at a much earlier period, and he's trying to codify some of these basic ideas about sort of like representational, like narrative art <laughs> that that we see as, again, quite obvious um, and sort of elementary, but hasn't always been that way. So this idea that the, the, the text or the performance is meant to imitate some aspect of real life, even if it's not necessarily realistic in terms of you know the events of the plot it's trying to recreate uh human feelings <laughs> human situations personality types character types uh just the idea that it's supposed to sort of be at, at some level uh it's my it's 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 imitating life it's representing reality uh, so again, we already kind of know a lot about genre. I just kind of like to warn students a little bit about sort of treating genre the, white, uh, uh, the right way, because it does matter. I mean, genre conventions matter. So as they talk about in the book, you need to know what you're getting into <laughs> when you sit down to read a work of literature and understanding the genre that that work belongs to is often very helpful. It gets you ready to read. So just as a quick example, I'm teaching a uh, 400 level literature class right now, basically about early American literature. So I always talk about genre when I introduce a new text. Before we get started on a new piece, I, I actually provide a lot of this, these traditional approaches. Uh, I give a little historical context, a little bit of author bio, uh, and then I talk about genre. So right now we're reading a sentimental novel from the 1790s. It's okay if that doesn't make any sense to you. But uh, before we read it, I need to tell my students a little bit about what sentimental novels are. We don't need to worry about it right now, but they do before they start reading the book because they need to understand certain characteristics, uh, certain features of this genre so they know what to look for. And they can also try to track the ways that this book is deviating from the typical sentimental formula. And it does. That's part of what makes it cool. So that's another thing you have to understand. It, it kind of reminds me of the, of the plot pyramid that we were talking about last week. Um, my attitude about genre is kind of my same, is the same as my attitude towards plot. You need to know all the elements. But it's no big deal if... Uh, the text you're analyzing does not conform to all of those elements. Genres are kind of meant to be played with in a lot of ways. So when you sit down to read a novel and you know that it's supposed to be a work of, you know, gothic romance, um, that's important regardless of, <laughs> that's important. <laughs> Let me try to make this sound coherent. That's important on Multiple, I mean, it, you need to know the conventions so you can see exactly what the author is doing with those conventions. Is the author sticking faithfully to the generic confines of the Gothic romance? If so, you can have opinions about that and talk about that. But it might also be possible that the author is departing in interesting ways from a lot of these generic conventions. Uh, so... That's often material that we can use later in our own discussions, in our own analysis. Because a lot of authors set us up to expect certain things based on the genre, right? When we sit down to watch a horror movie, there are certain conventions that we expect. There are certain features, certain elements that we expect to see uh, or experience in that film. So a lot of times writers and filmmakers will sort of play with those expectations. They might upset those expectations. They might defy certain traditions or conventions of a genre to surprise us and to make us think. So it's important to know the conventions, but not because every text has to conform 
to those conventions. Just like it's important to know the elements of plot, not because every plot has all of those elements, but if you know the elements, you can see which ones are included and which ones are left out. And then maybe you can talk about that. <laughs> this plot doesn't have a resolution. Or maybe you don't find this climax very uh, compelling. It's the same with genre. Right? If you're looking at a romantic comedy, maybe you like the fact that it sticks to the genre formula almost 100%. Perhaps you think that works. But it can also be interesting if the movie is making sort of a sort of com you know providing a commentary on the genre violating certain rules about the genre combining this genre with another genre because we see that too in literature and film and tv and other mediums so you know you don't have to be bound by genre just like you don't have to be bound by demanding that every plot has you know everything that we find there on the pyramid, but we need to know what's there and what's not. Uh, and then that can help to fuel our judgments uh, based on whatever we think and feel. So that's kind of where I come down on genre. And, you know, sometimes we like our text to stick to the genre. It's interesting how we, how we vacillate as critics and viewers. Sometimes we want a sort of formulaic approach. We want to get exactly what we expect. But then at other times, you'll see critics criticize a film or uh, a work of fiction for being too faithful to the genre, right? Genres can get worn out sometimes. Genres can get tired. We, we, we get sort of exhausted with the same beats, the same features, the same moves, the same characteristics. So, I don't know. It just depends on what we want. It depends, uh, you know, uh, maybe how we feel about certain genres. Some are privileged over others. Uh, but we need to know basic conventions so we can conduct good literary analysis. And as they point out, uh, you know, this... the. Genre study has been around for a long time. We, you know, genres change, uh, definitions change, but people have been doing this kind of work for a long time. And it sort of would serve as a foundation for some later approaches like formalism, like structuralism and post-structuralism that were really concerned with form. Because genre is too. A lot of genre study is looking at the structure, the form of these texts, and the features and the conventions that they contain. So that gets us kind of focused on that text level. We're not necessarily finding the most definitive version now. We're really studying the text in a, what we would think of as a more sort of tradition or a more contemporary literary analytical style, uh, trying to pull out meaning, but also trying to sort of understand the structure, understand how everything's been built. Uh, so in that way, genre study kind of serves as a foundation for a few later approaches. Because, again, genre kind of gets us away from some of those outer contexts, the history, the culture, the bio. And now we're more focused on these categories of texts and how the texts conform or maybe don't conform uh, to those categories. So, again, that's getting us more focused on formal features and key characteristics, uh, which can be very useful and we still do it. All right, so number three is an interesting one. It's similar to number one in the fact that it's very old and it's often associated with older texts. So this is source study. And there's kind of two sides of the coin here to think about with source study. So on one hand, it's very interested in tracking down the earlier texts that might have influenced the current text that we are studying. So looking at sources, possible sources that the author might have used. But on the other side, it also kind of tracks much like that textual criticism that we were talking about in number one. This style, the source study style, is also kind of tracking the process of composition through the different stages. So with source study, we can look at a lot of things, notebooks, drafts, 
different sources and various other influences that might have impacted the text that we're studying. So this is another one that, you know, not a lot of undergrads are necessarily asked to do, uh, at least not in a, in a really formal extended way. But we do this work often in sort of more short abbreviated ways. So they give some examples, you know, tracking down the illusions, that's illusion with an A, uh, in the wasteland or in the films of Tarantino, tracking down all of these references to other texts, older films. So we do that. I mean, I think a lot of contemporary critics and scholars do that. That's not usually our primary focus, <laughs> uh, but it's usually nice to unpack a few of those references, especially if they're to uh, sort of obscure cultural productions that a lot of people might not recognize. Uh, we can shed light on a lot of that stuff. Um, but that's kind of a, sur <laughs> to me, that's kind of surface level source study. They give an example on page 44 of the real practical application of this kind of approach. And they talk about this, pretty, he's a pretty famous American lit scholar named Matthew Broccoli. And he was a Fitzgerald scholar. And they talk about this painstaking work that he did with one of Fitzgerald's novels, uh, Tender is the Night. He goes through like hundreds of manuscript pages, proof sheets. I think there were nearly 20 drafts uh, and three different like finished versions of the novel. So that's real source study. And again, not a lot of regular humans really in 2020, I don't think really want to do that. Um, but Broccoli has done it. And in the process, he's, you know, shed a lot of light about the composition process of that famous novel. Now, the difference here, he's not quite doing what those guys did with Chaucer and Shakespeare, where they're trying to find like the most reliable definitive version that readers and scholars can use. That's not I mean, Broccoli isn't necessarily doing that. He's just trying to sort of study the process that Fitzgerald went through to write this book. I mean, it's a slightly different focus. Some of the work is the same, going back through manuscripts, going back through drafts, looking at corrections, looking at revisions that Fitzgerald made. Uh, so a lot of that work is similar. It's kind of almost like detective work, really, sort of textual detectives uh, but the, the end result is to kind of have this history, this narrative of the creation of this novel. It's not to give us the definitive version of the novel. I think he's pretty satisfied with that last version that actually got published. I don't think Fitzgerald disowned it or wanted to make major changes to it. So Bercoli's trying to tell us the story of the creation of this book. And along the way, he can talk about influences. Uh, things that happened to Fitzgerald, things he read or heard or saw that might have impacted the composition of the novel. So just to give you a brief anecdote from my own experience, if, if that helps, I don't know if it will. But when I was in a, I, I took a graduate class on just literary criticism and theory, but we had to do a little light source study as one of our major assignments. We had to pick a book or any work of literature, and we had to basically do this kind of work with it. So I chose a, a novel from the 80s called Ironweed. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. They made it into a movie with Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep, for what it's worth. You might be better off just checking out the movie, but it's this pretty well-known American novel written by this guy, William Kennedy. So I knew the book, but I didn't know anything about the composition history uh, or his influences. So I had to do a lot of research and I found out some cool stuff. Uh, uh, the book is set in Albany, New York during the Great Depression. It's about these winos, you know, these people down on their luck. And uh, uh, Kennedy himself is from Albany. He knew a, a great deal about the history of that city, but he wrote the novel while he was teaching at a university in Puerto Rico. <laughs> so I learned that. Uh, he didn't write a bunch of different versions, so I didn't have to go through a lot of manuscripts, luckily. But I did learn a lot about his influences and uh, some real people that he had read about from Albany's history that he used as uh, sort of loose uh, 
uh, sort of, uh, you know, inspirations for some of his characters. And some of the events depicted in the book were based on things that he had read about. He was also a journalist, so he had written some newspaper articles about things that had happened during the Depression. So I basically went back and kind of retraced a lot of his research, a lot of archival materials that he had looked at, and I also learned about his time in Puerto Rico. And <laughs> a lot of it didn't end up in my paper, but I did sort of touch on some of the biographical stuff uh, in the process because I learned a little bit about his life um, and kind of what was going on in his life when he wrote this novel. So I learned about influences. I didn't really work with illusions, but I also, because uh, there weren't a lot of, you know, bizarre ones, but I did track the composition history a little bit like Bercoli did, but of course my work was much more surface level but it just kind of gives you this new perspective because sometimes we lose sight of the fact that a novel is not really written uh you know in this sort of neat simple way it's often an ongoing process and again editors play a big role i did see a few letters some of the correspondence between kennedy and his editor and they did not always get along <laughs> so that was kind of entertaining uh so you learn about all of that but again does this directly lead into a lot of our heavy literary analysis lifting not always i mean sometimes like i said tracking down illusions yeah and also tracking down sources. So anytime we think that there's an older text that served as the basis uh, or at least provided inspiration in various ways for the text that we're studying, we need to know that. We might not do a ton with it, but we at least need to know it uh, just so we have the complete picture. So some of this might be useful, but maybe not necessarily all of it. All right, so we got two more approaches to cover. Number four is historical slash biographical. So these are really two different approaches, but we're lumping them together, much like we do with moral and philosophical uh, for number five. But historical stuff is still around, and I just want to emphasize that. <laughs> so number four is a little tricky because historical is really still with us. The old historicism, and I'll explain that in a minute, it's still with us, but again, it's been kind of refashioned and refurbished in certain ways, but the biographical side has largely fallen away, although not entirely. So let's start with historical. So again, like a lot of these traditional approaches, uh, it's been around, right, for a long time, but, it, but both historical and biographical, they weren't always called by those names. They did not always have a set of formal rules attached to them. Uh, but they became more codified and sort of standardized uh, in the 19th century, uh, primarily, you know, first in England. Uh, so with the historical, and, well, I'll just put them together because the book does. Uh, with the historical and biographical approach, we're basically claiming that a text is largely valuable for what it reflects about the historical period uh, in which it's set or the life and times of the author. And again, we've we come to view these approaches as very old fashioned and sort of inadequate. Uh, but they are kind of intertwined approaches and we still lean on them heavily, like I said, especially historical stuff. So anytime we're about to read uh, a historical novel, like a, a novel that's kind of a work of, it's kind of steeped in a particular historical period. You might think of it as historical fiction or like a period piece <laughs> that you might watch on TV. Anytime we're about to embark on a text like that, it's imperative that we know something uh, about the period in which it is set. So the examples in the book, you know, The Last of the Mohicans, a uh, famous American novel, you need to know a little bit about the French and Indian War in order to understand that book. You don't need to be an expert, you don't need to be a historian, but if you don't know anything about the war, a lot of the events of the plot are going to seem bizarre and inexplicable. Uh, you know, <laughs> what are the other examples? Oh yeah, Tale of Two Cities, you need to know a little bit about the French Revolution, and then The Grapes of Wrath, you need to know a little bit about the Great Depression. So again, when I teach lit, uh, this is largely what I do like as part of the introductory material. Like I mentioned, I provide that historical context. I give them a little bit of this before they start reading 
because it's going to help. It's going to help uh, their interpretation process. So they point out, you know, we often think of novels as being very steeped in particular historical time periods, maybe short stories too, but poetry is often a product of specific times and places as well. So just keep that in mind. Not, not as frequently as prose fiction, uh, but, but poetry can often also reflect certain uh, historical events or even comment on certain historical events or development. So, yeah, we, we don't reject the history the way we reject some of these traditional approaches. But again, our understanding of history has changed So in certain ways that we'll get into more later. But some of these newer approaches that have come along uh, over the last few decades, new historicism. New historicism is intentionally uh, contrasting itself from the old historicism. They're both interested in history. Uh, but as we'll see when we get to new historicism, uh, we're operating with a different conception of history in that particular school or critical approach. But also post-colonialism, cultural studies, uh, they are largely, and sometimes other approaches too, are largely based on historical knowledge and historical realities that we uh, need to sort of, you know, grapple with. <laughs> now, the biographical stuff, as the book points out, has kind of come under the most fire of probably all of the traditional approaches that we're covering. The biographical has maybe aged the worst. <laughs> I mean, again, the textual stuff and the source study, a lot of regular English majors don't do that kind of work. Um, but uh, we still can and we still see the value even if we're not ourselves doing it but there's a lot of question about how just how valuable biographical uh, approaches really are and some later schools or approach uh, some of the later schools of criticism would really uh, come down pretty hard on bio stuff uh, and really just sort of tear it apart and tell us that we don't need it uh, really at all. But again, I think it depends on circumstance. So as we know, some authors are somewhat biographical in their fiction. They use their own lives, uh, their own experiences, at least as a, as a basis or as a, as a foundation for a lot of what they write. So I don't think we always need to spend a lot of time on Biography, but I think it is helpful with certain authors. So they mention Twain and Shelley. That, that those are you know uh, Huck Finn and, and Frankenstein are two of the texts that they work with in almost every chapter. Uh, and again, we we can see why it might be helpful to know a little bit about Twain's life before we sit down to analyze Huck Finn, because scholars have already shown that Twain's taking a lot of these events, a lot of the characters, uh, obviously the settings, are largely based on places that he lived, you know, his hometown of Hannibal, Missouri, people he knew, uh, some things that he had done himself, perhaps. So some knowledge of Twain's life might be helpful when reading that particular text. Some might argue that a little bit of knowledge about Mary Shelley's life might be helpful when we're thinking about Frankenstein. At the very least, I mean, the way that book often gets taught, part of the introductory material does include some biographical detail about, you know, Shelley sitting around with her husband, Percy Shelley, and, and Byron, and they have the challenge to write the ghost story, uh, what there's out there in Lake Geneva or whatever. <laughs> I mean, whether you think that's important or not, it's often included. Uh, she was very young when she wrote the book, and of course her husband was a famous poet who had a lot of editorial sort of interference going on. So we could do some source study or maybe some textual scholarship about the influence that Percy Shelley had, and they show you that. But we could also maybe think of Mary Shelley's life as perhaps being important uh, in some ways to the novel itself and some of the themes and other features or elements that we see in the novel. And again, look at how they run through the biographical approach with that book 
you know, this idea of domestic sort of tranquility, knowing about her own childhood in this sort of radical household where things were very sort of unconventional. Maybe she had a desire for something more conventional. They, you know, some critics suggest that. We see models of more sort of conventionally happy families in the novel. So again, maybe her life does matter when we're thinking about that novel. But for a lot of authors and a lot of texts, we can do all the work that we need to do without really attending too much to bio. But you can always grab a few basic facts. When was the author alive? <laughs> it might always be good to know at what period of the author's career uh, they wrote the particular text in question. But beyond the basics, we don't typically dive too deep anymore when it comes to bio. And as we'll see later with some, uh, with some of the structuralist stuff, I mean, they really don't think the author matters all that much at all. <laughs> so some of these later approaches kind of want to annihilate or eliminate the author from consideration. We don't have to go that far, but we don't lean on bio very much anymore, but there are exceptions. Finally, moral and philo philosophical approaches. This is number five, our final one. The moral approach, I would argue, has largely dropped by the wayside, much like the biographical approach. Uh, but like the historical and biographical approaches, these have been around basically since ancient Greece. Uh, um, we've used them for a long time. And for a long time, as the book points out, the moral approach was sort of the standard by which most literature uh, was sort of judged. So again, we weren't, you know, in previous centuries, we weren't always regarding literature as primarily works of art or means of entertainment. We were looking at them as moral instruction or at the very least demanding that they provide some form of moral instruction. So uh, they were supposed to kind of teach virtue and morality while also perhaps exploring interesting uh philosophical issues, maybe, you know, shedding light on big questions or social dilemmas, but also leading audiences towards right action and virtue. These were very important things. And up until fairly recently, I mean, throughout the ancient period, uh, you know, through the Middle Ages, through the early sort of modern periods, up through early American literary history, books were still judged according to a lot of these standards. Does it teach a good lesson? Does, will it have a good influence on its readers? <laughs> and a lot of early novels, you might know, were viewed as kind of trashy and scandalous because they were viewed as, you know, not really providing the right kind of moral instruction that literature was supposed to provide. So again, largely in contemporary times, we kind of move away from all of these moral judgments, and we certainly don't demand that all texts include moral instruction or you know tell people the right way to live or the right things to do. We understand that some texts are designed that way. A lot of texts actually are still are designed that way, but certainly not all. Uh, but as the book points out, this still kind of reappears when we think about theme, one of our key literary elements from week one. So I know when I'm teaching my 101 students and we talk about theme, uh, you know, I sometimes do refer to it as the moral of the story or the lesson of the story. I don't really like to use that terminology, uh, but... I use it in 101 to help the students understand because a lot of them aren't quite sure they know what a theme is. But if you say the moral of the story, they've heard that before and they know what a lesson is. They've been taught lessons before so they can understand that that language a little bit better. Uh, but this telling that we still fall back on, on that kind of terminology. Uh, we still think of theme oftentimes as a moral. Uh, and again, sometimes that's appropriate because sometimes that is how the theme is functioning. But as we know, there are plenty of texts that don't really contain a lesson uh, necessarily. So it's not always productive to search for a uh, to search for a moral or a lesson. The more expansive understanding of theme is just larger meaning. And yes, yeah, sometimes the larger meaning might come in the form of a lesson or a moral, but not always. 
Uh, so we kind of already know that. So like the book points out in all of the texts that they discuss each chapter, there's this recurring theme of revenge. <laughs> so they point that out. And, you know, with this traditional approach, we would try to do something with that. We would say, OK, well, what is the significance of revenge? Now, I don't think we see necessarily a moral attached to revenge every time but we could do this kind of philosophical exploration of the concept right what does it mean how do humans think about revenge what does revenge mean for people how does it manifest in different ways uh is there such thing as just revenge versus unjust revenge or is it all unjust or is it i mean you know what i mean we could explore that concept of revenge. Once we identify it as a theme at work in any text that we might be uh, analyzing, then we can sort of do something with it uh, and explore it uh, as a concept uh, and sort of look at its importance. So that might still kind of fall under the umbrella of what we might think of as sort of a traditional philosophical approach to literature. So we can kind of lean that way, but we don't lean so much the moral way. Uh, but we still can't. And at any time we see a moral in a text, we can do something with it. We can agree with it, disagree with it, talk about its impact, whatever we like. But again, like a lot of other things, don't always look for a moral or a lesson or any kind of moral instruction because certainly not all texts provide those things. Some do some don't it's no longer a requirement <laughs> but for a long time going back to the, even you know 1700s 1600s it was kind of a requirement for a lot of literature all right so that's pretty much everything i want to cover uh for this week oh yeah well one more quick note and they mentioned this in the book but i just want to bring it up again because we'll talk about it later a common complaint lodged against more modern uh critical approaches like post-colonialism, like feminism, Marxism, or a lot of these other schools, one common complaint is that a lot of them are a little too focused on theme. Uh, in some ways, they're kind of old-fashioned because they're kind of participating in this old-fashioned moral approach. Uh, not that they're trying to talk about necessarily virtue and instruction, but they're focusing on theme over the form so that might be thought of as message over form because often what they want to do is talk about that larger meaning or that larger message of the text and how it sort of tracks you know sort of based on their ideological uh, orientation and a lot of modern scholarship works that way. Um, and they're a little bit less interested maybe in, you know, syntax. <laughs> they're a little bit less interested in meter or rhyme scheme, some of these more formal elements or even characteristics of genre uh, that we could talk about with genre study. Um, so, you know, just take that for what it's worth and, and we can sort of uh, navigate that a little bit more when we get to those schools. But again, what's old is new again. And even though they are quite different than the traditional approaches, a lot of the newer approaches that we're going to be learning about for most of the semester, they borrow a lot from these earlier methods or styles. So just keep that in mind and I will see you next week as we embark on formalism.